Good afternoon and thank you for joining Future of Finance. Today we will discuss green sell is gone, but bad habits in trade finance have not. I shall now hand you over to Dominic Hobson and our panel. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Green sell is gone, but bad habits in trade finance have not. I am Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance, and I'm delighted to moderate our discussion this afternoon. When we last visited the uh, trade finance issue in October last year, Greensill was on everybody's list of important innovators. It failed in March this year, casting a shadow over supply chain finance, if not trade finance as a whole. Yet its demise has cast light as well as shadow, but what the company did and why it failed provides valuable insights into where innovation is needed in trade finance and indeed where the innovation is occurring. Increasing capacity and widening access to finance as banks withdraw, for example, driving paper out of trade finance processing, the application of technology, especially of data science, to credit assessment and risk management, and of course, the value post green sill of sticking to established principles and standards in the conduct of business. Now, to help us assess progress in digitization, standardization and management and use of data in trade finance before and after Greensill. I'm joined by five people who bring to the discussion not just experience but a wide variety of perspectives. Alex Galandris is co-CEO at SDOCS, a 15-year-old company that provides fraud reducing and operational cost-cutting digital and legal infrastructure that underpins paperless documentation of global trade and finance by connecting shippers, ship owners, chambers of commerce, agents, forwarders, traders, banks, inspectors, freight terminals, and end customers. Gert Silvest is co-founder and VP of Network Products at TradeShift, the trade technology platform that originated in Denmark, but is now run from San Francisco, and which continues to pursue its original mission of digitizing information flows between companies, and now has also expanded into running B2B marketplaces, transaction management, digital identity, payment services, and finance. Magnus Armfist is Head of Exchange Development at Expri, which provides exchange and trading technology as a service to any traditional or alternative exchanges looking to disrupt the status quo, including in global trade, agricultural commodities and uh, warehousing. Tom James is CEO, CIO and co-founder of Singapore-based Tradeflow Capital Management, a fund which he co-founded to plug the trade finance gap faced by SMEs in the global bulk commodity industry by taking ownership of the commodities being shipped to holding cash rather than lending directly to the end buyer. Geoffrey de Mowbray is the co-chairman of the British Exporters Association and CEO at Dints International, a supply chain provider who've been operating in Africa for 14 years, focused on mining and infrastructure projects. Dints are now digitizing their trade cycle to create an ecosystem that aims to simplify global trade by bringing together connectivity, finance and sustainability. Now, in addition to our panelists, as always at a Future of Finance webinar, we have our audience, uh, that's you. We want your questions, we want your comments, so do please send them, keep sending them throughout the webinar using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We will not be saving them up to the end, but we'll answer them as we go along, so you can be, if you choose to be, an integral part of our discussion right from the start, and all six of us are gonna be very disappointed if you don't take that opportunity. I've mentioned Greensill, and I'm going to begin by asking our panelists what Greensill was doing differently and how much its demise actually matters to what's arguably the most pressing issue in trade finance today, namely capacity. Greensill was obviously uh, much admired in the trade finance industry for its uh, capacity for innovation, uh, but in getting paid by buyers rather than sellers, it was only doing what lots of banks and other firms do perfectly successfully uh, and which haven't fallen over, and that adds capacity uh, to the industry at a time when banks are for a variety of reasons, not least of which is KYC and AML considerations, reducing their exposure to trade finance. So Alex, could I perhaps begin with you? Do you think that Greensill damaged an innovative source of increased capacity or does the firm's role as a kind of arranger rather than being a bank or financier uh, mean it's simply too small to make much difference to how the industry operates and evolves? So, I mean, I think there's a, there are a couple of parts uh, to this. Dominic, so first, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. Um, but I think the first part is that innovation wasn't the failure here. It wasn't that their innovation, innovative technology fell down. It was that they used cookie cutter fraud. 
ultimately. And unfortunately, their financiers didn't do a good enough job of understanding the trades that they were financing. Um, and I think this was more a failure of due diligence than a failure of a specific type of financing. There has been and there always will be at some level fraud in trade. And ultimately, the correct application on and use of technology should significantly reduce fraud. Um, so I think this wasn't a failure in innovation. This was just a cookie cutter failure in due diligence, unfortunately. And I don't think it will have a long term effect. I think it will temporarily hurt people in explaining how other supply chain financing solutions are not green sill. Thank you, Alex. Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on on the meaning of green sill for the state of the industry? I think, you know, as Alex mentioned, in the short term, and we've noticed that actually in our, uh, with some of our funders, there is a, um, it's clearly sent a bit of a shockwave down and there are more nerves and, and heightened due diligence and things. No doubt that will subside. But with things like this, it's incredibly uh, unfortunate, but equally, these are the things that hopefully the industry will learn for and make better uh, and, and strive to make things better rather than putting them, putting them off it. I do, it, it's, challenging really because there is because the whole trade cycle isn't fully digitized yet there's always going to be scopes for the scope for things to creep in and for the fraud to take place but i think as things continue to evolve and more and more corporates actually do digitize their supply chain it will be it will become simpler or less risky for these things but i overall i think What's happened with Green Seal is, is a great shame. Uh, it is going to have some short term effects, but equally, as with everything, learn from the mistakes. And I hopefully people in other organisations will build, uh, learn from their mistakes and build better solutions. Tom, uh, you, you heard Alex say that this is really a, a failure of, of customer due diligence. Uh, you've heard Jeffrey say that uh, this has had some effect on, on non bank uh, funders of, of, of trade finance. You're operating in an industry which is utterly dominated by an oligopoly of banks, like most financial markets. It seems to be, you know, a small number of banks which own most of the business. Yet there are these these clear shortages of capacity. What explains the the structure of the industry, and how close are organisations like yours actually to to plugging that gap? That's a good question, Dominic. I mean. Back in 2016, when me and my co-founder sort of kicked things off, uh, it actually took us two years to deeply analyze and develop the business model, looking at you know why banks couldn't lend, because they obviously want to lend, that's how, make, how they make money, and, and the issues for SMEs, who we focus on, why they couldn't borrow. And I think it actually links into what uh, Alexander and Jeffrey have said. It, it, in the end, it came down to data. Uh, a lot of the time, the trade finance applications were, were being, or finance applications were being turned down because the banks uh, didn't feel they had enough data, enough transparency uh, on the business, uh, all the transactions um, in order to, to do things. And, and then of course, the other issues that a lot of the time the transactions were too small to be profitable uh, for the banks. It wasn't that they're bad deals. Um, uh, and so that's where we took the approach of well, if you can't get enough data and if the SMEs, the companies don't have enough track record to analyze in a normal credit lending perspective and you, you can't maybe uh, put a lot of trust on it, then just don't lend money. And that's where we step in to, to actually buy and own the commodity um, because at least there, you know, there are a lot of people involved. <laughs> there is a product and you can tell if there is a ship or not a ship, <laughs> usually. Um, so, you know, the, it's much more uh, transparent and, and you can, as a principal in the transaction, you're getting all the data and can control a lot more of the, uh, the processes. Now, Gert, banks and non-banks have to inhabit the same industry. How should they, how should they work together? On the one hand, you know, trade finance should be a no-brainer for most banks. You know, the terms are short, the risk is low, the returns are you know are good uh should they should they compete with banks or should they um look to supplant what banks think what is the what is a stable interaction between banks and non-banks in global trade finance which ensures that not just smes but everybody has sufficient capacity to to drive world trade which after all is the source of all our standard of living it's a hugely important business yeah uh good question and 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 maybe stability is not the, the word that 
comes to, to, to my mind first. So, so I think banks and non-banks uh, will of course both collaborate and, and compete. Uh, I think that's a given. Uh, I think if, if you look at the global picture where you have seven to nine trillion dollars outstanding uh, in, in trades between people who buy some goods, owe some money to another party and, and, and sellers that ultimately expect to be paid, we know that it's, it's just 15 to 20 percent of that total volume that is served at any, any given point in time. So when we think about banks role in the global trade, we have to remember that it's a very limited set of clients that they are served. And they actually prevented from serving uh, the majority of the market here, uh, and and it's a little bit about center and periphery. When you spoke about Greensill, you said they do as so many others. They take um, the data from the buyers and they expect to be uh, repaid in the end by buyers. Um, and I think to serve the rest of the market, I think you fundamentally have to think about more uh, seller centric uh, models. And, and for that to work, I, I think digitization is, is kind of table stakes. You, you, you need to drive that. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think banks are definitely open to, to fund these kind of resources. But I think also when you think of the, the kinds of, of funds that banks come with, they also do come with certain requirements that are borrowed from, from that segment of uh, corporate clients that they typically deal with. And that is that is also impacting user experience. So when speaking to banks, we see that they're also very conservative in the types of data and checks on the companies that they serve. And, and I think if you want to address uh, the remaining 80% of the market, you have to think very carefully about what are the kinds of data that you want to operate on, data that is born in marketplaces and outside of sources that banks normally have access to. Mm. Then I think you also have to question the whole set of, of requirements uh, that banks normally come with when when they offer capital of, uh, for this kind. So, so I think it works for certain segments, um, but I, I think in the next five to 10 years, I, I think we are gonna see uh, a, a whole swath of, of new uh, financial markets that that will uh, offer capital in, to, into the space. So, so not just banks. Yeah, but well, I'd like to ask Alex and uh, and Tom and, and Jeffrey a bit about about this SME funding gap in a minute, uh, particularly in emerging markets. What we do, I'd like to to field this question from a member of our audience, uh, uh, Reynold uh, Tuma, who said there have been media reports the commodity trade finance team of Credit Suisse and also a major global international trading company had pre-advised uh, Credit Suisse about the obscure and difficult to explain dealings of GFG Alliance and related companies. Yet the support to Greensill kept going for years. How can such news not damage the whole concept of supply chain financing? Which goes back to my original question, really, which is, you know, how much damage has this done um, to, to supply chain finance? Um, Alex? Yeah, so I read that same report. It was an FT article a few days ago saying that Trafigura had recognised that one of the receivables listed by Greensill as an asset was not a real receivable. There had been no trade that Trafigura was involved in. Um, and the story then goes that Credit Suisse did not then dig into that. Assuming that that is correct, and I cannot imagine for any reason whatsoever that Trafigura would be lying about that. Uh, and we obviously do not know the full extent of what Credit Suisse did on the back end of that. This, that is actually part of my point. This was a failure of due diligence. It's not that the underlying form of finance was flawed. It's that there was no transaction. It was just fraud. Mm -hmm. So it's not that going off and taking an invoice and dynamically discounting it and financing against that is an inherently a risky prospect. It works very well. Um, for many, many years, that form of supply chain finance has been going on. And yes, it's becoming more innovative and, and more widely accepted. And it's critically important right now um, with the current trade finance gap, which will get worse after Basel IV. We are about to run into a wall where banks are not going to be providing trade finance after Basel IV. It's not going to be financially viable for them. And there is no one that can come in and fill their balance sheets today with knowledge, right? There's no one who has experience and balance sheets that can fill that gap. Okay, well, I, I read the International Chamber of Commerce um, survey or uh, on its website, and it, it talks about this 1.5 trillion 
uh, funding gap for, for SMEs. Now, Greensill was, of course, trying to address that with its fund-based backing and the insurance cover and so on. Um, and I, I think you were saying, Alex, that, that actually Greensill is not a disaster for supply chain finance because it was what we're dealing here with, with, with assets that didn't exist and it's a, a failure of due diligence, it's not a failure of the model uh, and the supply chain financing can survive this. But that gap is going to increase after Basel IV from one and a half uh, trillion. Um, so, Tom. Well, the gap is already bigger, actually. So, that 1.5 it was a piece of research done by Asia Development Bank. And the 1.5 trillion comes from banks who had rejected loans. Right. I can guarantee you, most SMEs don't even bother to apply for supply uh, for finance because they know they won't get it. Right. So it is going to be a substantially bigger gap than that headline number. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, to add to what Alex said, I mean, I think Standard Charter did their own survey, and they were they were quoting figures a few months back of close to three billion, sorry, three trillion. Right. The trade finance gap now post COVID. Um, and again, as Alex said, we, we don't know what's never applied for in the first place. <laughs> uh, I mean, our own experience as a SME focused fund with, with quite a global footprint now, um, we're still small, but the fact is we had 10 times more uh, trade uh, to, to potentially support than we could before COVID. And now without any effort in terms of origination for, on our part, we've got 30, 40 times more business than we can support. Uh, you know, and we've been doubling, tripling our AUM um, over the last 18 months. So it's been, uh, you know, we're really seeing um, where, you know, uh, like uh, Alex said, Basel three, Basel four coming up in a couple of years time already, you know, the when we started looking at the SME trade finance gap back in 2016, if you didn't turn over $200 million a year, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as long as you turned over $200 million a year, you might have a conversation with the bank. Now, you, you close to half a billion dollars a year turnover before you get a cup of coffee because it's just not profitable for them to, to support you. Mm -hmm. now, now, I'd like to bring Magnus in in a minute to talk about what digitization can do to help plug this gap. But before I do, Jeffrey, I'd like some observations from you. Uh, this is not just an SME thing. This is an emerging market problem as well. It's very difficult for banks these days to do business uh, in some emerging markets because they can't satisfy themselves on the KYC AML front, uh, let alone the problems they have with the capital allocations they have to make. So tell us about the funding gap you see in the in the in the emerging markets you've a lot of experience in africa no indeed and without a doubt there is a funding gap and i think the the biggest challenge is is there seems to be plenty of funding eager to go into emerging markets but actually translating that into a way to operate which works with the commercial structure is 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 the main challenge you know we've done one recently and <clears throat> incredibly onerous uh, to get there and we're, we're sort of happy to do that because um, we know what's required but when it starts requiring the client to do things that are out of you know out of the ordinary for them it, it does become very challenging and I think you know the reality is most of our business is done on an open account basis uh, and uh, yes you can use credit enhancements credit insurance or other covers but that's that's just how 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 the business works and finding Finding some way to bring more visibility to that risk uh, and technology has clearly got a, a, a place, um, a, key part, a key place to, to enable this is really important because, you know, there are good deals happening every day, which most people, you know, coming to someone's point from earlier, uh, aren't bothering to apply for because it's going to be more hassle than just doing it oneself. And it only gets to the point where it's so big that you can't do it with your own resources that you um, that you do go to normally a non bank and normally a non bank lender. So it's it's incredibly challenging, but ultimately, people in general or companies in general do find a way to make it work. But it's not the most efficient, and it certainly doesn't match the funding that's out there with the with the transactions that are required. So it's it's a big it's a big challenge, really, um, and and. One that, you know, if I, without sort of offending anyone who may be on the call who's in this, it's all a little bit old school still. You know, there's still, with the exception of some of the other panellists today in specific areas, it is still still all very paper-based, all very, it just, it, it needs to be streamlined. And when we look at Africa as a continent, they've leapfrogged many challenges with digital innovation. And I think once we 
get to the point where we can pull together all of these great digital innovations into a sort of single ecosystem that works seamlessly for people and covers off risks. Uh, it may even create a different asset class and how trades looked at, but at, at the moment it's still very frustrating, very hard work. And as a result, a lot of people shy away from it. Now, Magnus, you've been very patient. I'd, I'd like to bring you in. That same ICC survey I referred to found that only 29% of the respondents in trade finance had actually driven paper out of their process on the issuing and advising side. Mm. Settlement and financing side, it was 21%. Document verification, it was just 8%. And this is an industry in which, you know, you've got a lot of paper flying around, letters of credit, bills of lading, certificates of origin, insurance certificates, goodness knows what, there's a lot of this stuff flying around. And, and the gains from digitizing seem so obvious. You, know, you save a lot of money, you cut your capital costs, you, you know, reduce your human errors. Um, and then the survey is saying nobody's doing it. What, what, what explains why, why an industry so desperately in need of, of digitization is not doing it? So I'm sure, Alex, you've got some views on this, too. Yeah, uh, Dominic, yeah, it's a great question, right? And I, and, and I think another important point why digitization makes makes sense is is back to your original first question on on Greensill and why they fail. The, the due diligence and the oversight is so much easier as well if we, we did digitize the, the access to data and the analytic analytics that you can do is is just so much more accessible than than, than a paper based trade. Um, the why isn't it done more? I, th I think there are couple of barriers it's i mean it's change first of all so so if you digitize properly you you will your workflows will change and the the, the the processes within your firm will change so so and it's a natural resistance to to that of course um and unfortunately i also think that the it's also sort of a, a, a barrier in in the cost and the type of technology that has been available broadly um, it, it, the, the initiations of the projects I, I, and the, the times it's taken to deploy them has, has just been too long and too high. So, so yeah. Thanks. I, I, I think that's a, a simple reason. And that's every, every major company, they have a cupboard they can open and they have like five, six of these uh, failed the projects. Uh, so it's like we've had EDI since uh, 1971. We've had tons of standards, technology driving this, and, and still you have, you know, the lower 20% adoption of, of digitization between the participants. And I think the reason is very simple, and that is that there's not enough value for the counterparties in this. So you can drive a nice digitization program where you want to move all of your sellers to electronic invoicing. But the truth is that that 80% or maybe more of these are just going to say, what's in it for us? And they're going to conclude that there is nothing in it for them. And they are going to put that at the end of their backlog. And that's going to define the success of that digitization program. And I think that's a story that has repeated over and over and over for decades. So until, until we solve that, like how do we actually create value for, for every participant in a supply chain digitization? It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So um, dare I suggest, Alex, that actually certain of the of the intermediaries in the in the trade finance is actually quite like paper you know it, it's physical it's transferable it's readable um but more importantly what do you think are the are the are the real barriers to change uh, it, you know english law which plays a very large role in in trade finance makes it difficult actually to digitize something as simple as a um a letter of credit or a or a, a bill of lading um at the same time you've got um there have been projects, as, as Gert was referring to, I'm thinking here particularly the, trying to replace um, letters of credit with bank payment obligations, and that seemed to, to stall because people wouldn't change their modus operandi. So is, it, is, there a, a, is there a legal problem? Is there a problem with the, the corporates, the end users of these products? What are the real barriers that prevent people adopting something which, which makes sense? Why does everyone have a cupboard full of failed projects? I, I think we've already touched on the real problem. The real problem is change. People don't like change. And here to change trade finance, you need to change multiple industries simultaneous. So it's not just, there's enough failed projects within their own organization. Now you're talking about change across a financial supply chain. That's a massive undertaking. So 
if people don't want change, what are they going to do? They're going to go, oh, well, the legal's not there. Oh, the technical standards aren't there. Oh, this isn't there. That you will get every excuse under the book when someone doesn't want to change. Whereas on the other hand, if someone does want to change, you're not going to hear those excuses. You'll just see change. So the DCSA, which is uh, the container lines created as um, an industry body to, to create standards for container lines, mm -hmm. uh, has gone off and said bills of lading in the container trade is, is, is digitized to such a small extent it's low below 0.1%. We have customers in certain markets that are 100% digital because in those markets, they wanted to digitize and they got their counterparties on and they've digitized you know, something incredibly complicated. So if people want it to work, it will work. The other thing is ultimately you needed a trigger to drive trade digitization. And I think Gert really nailed it. At some point in time, someone won't get enough massive benefit to, to be driven by it. They might be whipped into it, right? Walmart might come along and go supply it. You're so small, you're gonna do it this way and they will do it. And, and, and so big enough people can drive their specific supply chain, but on average, most people don't get enough benefit until now. With COVID, what we've seen is that supply chains that are paper-based fall down and fall down badly. And we've been living with really, really bad processes to get through this period. But if that continues, you think green cell was a bad fraud. We are going to get some mammoth frauds because we're no longer really using secure processes at the moment for a lot of our trade finance because we can't, because paper can't get around. Not everyone's working from her, not everyone's working at the office. Um, so COVID has absolutely underlined the fact that you cannot rely on paper. Um, and there really is a fundamental risk here and also has driven the change that a lot of people are going to refuse to go and work back in an office five days a week. And again, if you're going to be in a distributed work environment, you need to digitize. So I think there's two massive changes in the last 15 months, which we'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, on certain parts of our business, we have seen complete explosion of adoption on our electronic certificate of origin business. We saw 10 years growth in the first three months of COVID. Why? Because it was a need. Yeah, and I think, I mean, when talking about COVID, I mean, our our core business is totally digital. Um, and uh, we've been working towards getting all our contracts and everything digital um, before, and we just got it in time before COVID hit. So it's that, um, you know, when we were forced to all work from home as a company, it wasn't such a tough move. Um, you know, we thought, you know, the fact that couriers couldn't deliver the bits of paper, you know, your DHL, your FedEx was not being able to move stuff around and that ships were being stuck, unable to discharge cargoes would have highlighted, you know, this fundamental flaw in the paper chain uh, of, uh, of trade. Um, but clearly not enough. <laughs> As Alex said, you know, EBLs, and everything is still uh, generally quite a small percentage. But what I, my, my takeaway though of COVID was that uh, was one of regulation. I was quite curious to see, and um, I'm so from memory here, I'm pretty sure it was Peru. And I think they were, they were the only ones that came out and actually said, you've got six months to go digital, otherwise you're not importing, exporting to Peru. And so everyone's go digital. Now, the thing is, is that as a commodity industry, um, there are solutions out there, you know, SDOTs being one of them. Um, and you can now make the choice of how you digitize, or you can stick around until the regulators tell you this is what you're going to do and you've got six months to do it. Um, because I think ultimately, you know, we're thinking about improving processes, reducing fraud, but there's even a bigger overarching thing about data and tracking and embargoes and making sure the right stuff goes to the right people and not to the, the wrong people, depending on which side you're sitting on, <laughs> the political fence. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, international uh, interest to um, push digitization because it also allows you to uh, see the bigger picture of what's, what's going on where. But Tom, we also have the counter side of that, right? Which is certain countries are trying to promote blockchain capabilities, financial regulators very often require data sovereignty. Now, how do you have data sovereignty in cross-border trade, right? I cannot, if I export from the UAE, I cannot keep that original data only in the UAE. 
right? Because ultimately, chances are it was financed in Hong Kong or Singapore, and maybe the goods are going to Japan or, or China. That data needs to transition. And, and so there's some weird governmental policy problems that, are, that, that, that risk some of these, some of this um, innovation and, and transformation. Uh, you've hit on a very, very good point there, Alex. I mean, you know, here in Asia, um, we're seeing it all over the place now, but certainly I think first and foremost, even a few years ago uh, with uh, Chinese, uh, particularly state companies uh, and Chinese firms were saying, where are your servers? You know, where's our data being held? It has to be held in data storage in China. We don't want it on a, a cloud-based server in, uh, in California or something. Um, and, but it is Europe as well, data protection acts and everything. It is an absolute minefield uh, for, for compliance, yeah. Well, data is an important part of what we're going to talk about. We'll, we'll come back to that. Before we do, just uh, Magnus, perhaps you could give us a perspective as a, as a technology vendor. You've heard Alex say, for example, there's a huge spectrum of, you know, at one end people are fully digitized, at the other end it's still um, incredibly manual and, and, and paper-based. And this is a global industry and it's got a lot of different intermediaries involved in it and they're all over the map. They're in all sorts of countries. They have all sorts of budgets and all sorts of capabilities. I mean, how hard is it just purely from a, a technology budget point of view to start digitizing your processes in trade finance? Um, it, it is actually surprisingly simple. The, the, the a, a modern, a modern- a Surprisingly modern technology... cheap as well. Sorry? Surprisingly cheap as well as surprisingly easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, of, of course, of course, Tom. The, I mean, mo mo modern systems today, they are scalable and elastic in, in, and they are light and easy and quick to deploy. And they are easy to integrate into existing ecosystems using modern APIs. Um, this means that you can start small. Right. You, can, you can start with a very small system that then seamlessly expand as, as you bring more business onto the system. Um, and this is really how I recommend people do it. They, they start with a proof of concept um, and they kind of deploy that in the organization and they change the processes internally for, for that specific segment and then they kind of roll it out broader. Um, and that, that can... a question there, though, to that point. I understand how an SME who does have no systems can do that. But medium sized and big organizations that have massive systems and likely old systems are not that technologically capable, right? And they don't have the flexibility you talk about. So, how do they do it so easily? Yeah, it, it, that's true. That's true. I mean, and, and if, if you then also on that need data migrations and, and, um, and systems coexisting and so on, then, then it, it does become thornier and, and more complex. It does. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the honest and maybe boring question there is, is that the devil's in the detail in that scenario. I, you, you can do more than you think with, with interoperability and, and having systems coexist and so on. It, again, it is the, the technology has evolved a lot in, in, in that its APIs are smarter and easier to, to integrate with today than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Now, Gert, is one, of the, is one of the problems here when you're trying to digitize this, that the processes themselves are broken. We see this in a lot of financial markets where, well, I wouldn't have started from here, but the reality is, as Alex says, you are starting where you've got a legacy, not just legacy technology, you've got legacy processes and you can't simply throw them away and start again. So do you have to rethink the processes themselves? Yeah, and in a way, I, I think it's less about the specific processes, but by some of the silo thinking that that, that comes out of this. I, I think companies are often misdiagnosing what, what, what is the issue we are trying to solve here. And, and like digitizing paper or having more e efficient process flows in the AP department is typically not the problem for the business that they're trying to solve. Like, right, so so what we just talked about COVID reminds us of what, what is what is the, the business imperative here. And that, that is to keep a stable, predictable, performing supply chain. And when you have financial risk, you have process risk, exceptions, uh, problems due to paper and compliance, you're not maintaining that. Um, and I think to solve that, you have to work together between the different silos in the enterprises. So I think if you purely look at this from an accounts payable automation perspective, you're gonna fail because you're not gonna realize the benefits that comes with also deploying, for example, early payments in the supply chain that might actually incentivize people 
to to uh, to jump on the uh, digitization bandwagon in in your supply chain. And if you only speak to uh, to treasury, you're going to end up speaking just to your relationship banks and not talking about what are the you know the synergies for accounts payable and, and procurement that you're going to get. So I think that's one of the things where in general companies need to zoom out a little bit and look holistically at what is actually the objectives that they're trying to follow and how can they work together in, in the org to achieve that. Because I, I think the truth of it is if you actually combine some of the high level value adds, uh, such as early payments or marketplace related benefits, then you can easily use that to actually offset the cost of the purely technical part of the exercise, which is implementing things. And you can create the incentives for people to actually join in there. But I, I, I do think it's a more difficult conversation. It's a more difficult sell. You have to go into the org. You have to go to convince people to speak together. And maybe they don't have a shared agenda around these kind of topics. So it is difficult. But um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think the trend is very much changing. And I think it's like the financial crisis and, and COVID has helped change uh, people's mindset on, on this. That's yeah, interesting. Oh, sorry. Um, who was that? Uh, uh, Tom, go ahead. Mm -hmm. no, I was just going to add to, to Gerd, I mean, because you just reminded me an interesting thing is that we, um, not initially, but we, we actually started offering discounts in terms of our costs to, to our SME customers, as we call them, to enable their trades if they go digital. It's not always possible, you know, to go completely digital, but basically, uh, you know, if you go more and more digital, then... You know, it's not going to cost you so much to do your transaction. And we've had customers do the same, Tom. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, surely what? Is, sorry. No, go ahead, Jeffrey. I was going to say, surely as well, you know, the talk about struggling for the larger companies to, you know, adopt this because it's much more of a challenge. I mean, as with other industries we've seen in the world, is this not just a market ripe for disruption? Because those who build their business model around this uh, are surely going to displace the companies that are that are there and you know there seems to be there's growing interest in in the sort of b2b cross-border space but there's a, a not yet a huge amount of people challenging the the most shall we say the larger and perhaps um historical business models and surely there's huge scope for many innovators and disruptors to come in and just do things different from the outset rather than trying to uh Force change in businesses which are just so large, it's going to, it's, by the time they've turned a few degrees in their direction, someone else will have created something else. I mean, surely that's what's going to play out. And those who catch up survive, and those who don't, don't. You know what, though, I would have thought, that, and I agree with you, don't, don't get me wrong, I, I think that there's massive disruption that can happen in this entire space. But the most obvious players to do that disruption are the Alibabas and the Amazons. And if you look at this, Alibaba just got taken down at the knees by the Chinese government. The US government has just installed a 32-year-old head of FMC who already believes that actually our definition of antitrust in the US is incorrect because of platform businesses. So actually, the people who could have done this the most easily won't be allowed to do it. And everyone else who's tried it hasn't got to major critical mass. I mean, Ask Trade Shift how long they've been around. You guys have been around longer than we have. We've been around for 15 years and we are the very beginning of this story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's so damn difficult. And it's not like we're not trying to be completely innovative and completely disruptive, to be honest. Yeah, Which we had, yeah, we had Bolero on our last panel and they've been around 30 years or something. So I take yeah. your point. But one, one sort of cursory now, you've mentioned um, platforms, Alex, which is, which is this, I, when I was thinking about this, I wondered if what trade finance needs is not just digitization, it actually needs marketization, by which I mean not the creation of, of platforms which everybody starts to use and, and which get paid um, really for making use of the data which that platform generates, but actually some sort of distributed model in which um, networks and sub-networks can all uh, interoperate with each other using um, standardized protocols, standardized message templates, standardized APIs even. Um, and so you don't have to have this massive investment in, in technology up front, and you could disrupt this market by, um, by coming in with a, with a decentralized model. Now, now, now Gert is shaking his head and Alex is nodding. So I'm I am nodding. I am nodding. Oh, you were nodding. It was a, it was, I thought you were, you were, you were shaking. So 
I haven't described it very well, but is that a plausible method of the type of disruption, of getting to the disruption which Jeffrey has, has introduced? It's actually a prerequisite to getting to the type of disruption that Jeffrey's talking about, right? You need to standardize contracts. You need to standardize uh, everything, right? And then you can develop a market place and with true marketplaces, the cost of execution goes almost to zero. Um, but we are a gazillion years away from that, right? International trade has so much variation. Uh, you know, do I sell FOB? Do I buy, do I sell CIF, CFR? Just even the INCO terms then get, then get further negotiated down. Standardized agreements and bills of lading, let's use BIMCO. Uh, BIMCO does dry bills of lading, right? Congen bill is the most used bill of lading in dry shipping. Uh, it's often used in tanker shipping. In Estox's system, we have 50 variations of the BIMCO standard bill because everyone comes along, takes a standard and then deviates from it. So yes, you need the standardization, but it's not happening. And there's no one to drive standardization, right? When, when the uh, airline business went to e-tickets, they went to e-tickets because IATA controlled the underlying technology to do it. But IATA has been working on the electronic airway bill now for 20 plus years. And they're doing very well, don't get me wrong. They're, they're about 70 plus percent. But it took them 20 years to do that. It took them one day to do the e-ticket because they just turned off the system. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're, we're probably a, we're a very small uh, proof of concept for a, a massive monster problem, obviously running into the trillions. But we've been quite successful in digitization um, where banks might have been unable to, to put pressure on customers. Because if you put pressure, if you're a bank and you put too much pressure on customers, they'll go somewhere else easier <laughs> if they don't like it. But obviously, in our case, we're supporting SMEs. Um, who are trying to gear up uh, their business and expand it. Um, and so we're able to really encourage them to, to digitize um, because, because that, that's, you know, as a principle, we're not lending money. So we've got a lot of data we have to, to manage as a, as a counterparty between the suppliers and buyers. And it's the only way we can really do it efficiently to support them. So it's really like help us to help you go digital, please. Um, so that seems to... Um, uh, win them over. Well, I'd like Magnus to talk about how how difficult it is uh, to digitize without standards. But in response to what you said, Alex, and nobody's driving standards. I thought in preparing for this webinar, I ought to find out what's going on in standards in trade finance. And so I go to, to, to the ICC, I have a look there, I go to SWIFT. Next thing I know, I'm at the Legal Entity Foundation, I'm at the, I'm at the UN, I'm at the OAS, I'm at the OECD, I'm at various organizations I'd never heard of. Um, you know, but I'm also organizations, plenty of organizations I have heard of, like the WTO and the World Bank, and there's a bar association, there's, you know, there's all sorts of people seem to be involved in this. How could we, how could we find that body that could actually drive standardization in this space? Is that just basically an impossible project and we have to wait for some, I don't know, commercial collapse or something to, 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 to concentrate minds? So the ICC banking I think it's, has a digitization work group that's doing certain work, but it's very specific and it's focused on, for example, APIs for trade finance. Yeah. But we've spun off in Singapore um, a thing called DSI. Um, and the ICC DSI is spearheading standards. They're not creating them. They're going to all the people you're talking about and right. saying, we're going to take your standards and we're going to promote the hell out of them. So the DSI is doing exactly what you're saying. Uh, and getting them adopted by banks and by corporates is it, definitely and and i think the icc both through dsi and through icc paris for example has done a lot of work you mentioned the legal problems and legality uh there was a model law that came out that was published by Unsa uh, trial sorry three years ago called the model law on electronic transferable records uh, at local level enacting this would recognize electronic bills of lading, bills of exchange, promissory notes, and warehouse warrants. ICC has done a lot of work on getting this uh, adopted. It's now been adopted in Singapore, in parts of Abu Dhabi, and Bahrain was the first country. A number of other countries are coming fast behind it, but the G7 came out about two weeks ago and pledged to adopt this law. And a lot of that's being pushed by the ICC and some other NGOs. Yeah, and yeah, I can vouch for that. I mean, that with the DSI, we've partnered with uh, the ICC now 
and their trade now platform, which is sort of just getting underway, which is sort of to match SMEs with solutions, including financing solutions. And uh, we're very excited in giving input on the, the DSI as well. And we'll definitely be looking to apply those like the whole world applies in code terms, which were created by the ICC. We certainly will be promoting the, the digital standards as well. So I, I, I think there's one thing about digital standards, like like sometimes it's it's like, you know, if, if just this, the right standard was there, but it, it has to be a marriage of, of the right standard and, and the right business models. And, and I think, I mean, what, what I see inside of the, the shipping industry, whether it's DCSA or, you know, what what TradeLens has, has attempted to do is less, less about standards, but what the infrastructure is, is so inside out, like starting from the view of the shipping industry, but actually, if you take the ecosystem view of it, you have to think who are all the participants in this ecosystem that will have to not just adopt the standard. I think that's the simple part. It's like, just tell me what I have to do, but it's actually the step after. How are they going to, why are they going to invest in making this change and, and drive this change? And that's, and that's where I think the business models come in, into this, that if they don't get hand to hand, that you ensure a, a fair share of value in the ecosystem of driving that digitization, it's just never going to take off. And if you look at the shipping industry, I mean, since intra, there have been so many standardization uh, projects and infrastructure projects. And, and I, I, I think the reason why you don't see any of them really take off is, is because the right set of standards haven't been right married with the right. Uh, I'm not sure I'd say Intrad yeah. wasn't successful, right? They had 120,000 customers when they got bought out by E2 Open. So, I mean, I, they were definitely successful. At least they were successful a, in a sense, but I think they, they fell very short of their ambition. And I think you saw uh, customers everywhere in the sh shipping industry that basically decided we cannot wait for Intra. And they went out there and they went with commercial players all over the spectrum because Intra was simply too slow moving and was, True, you know, was trying to not... solve everything as a... As but a would that not it stop, it's shareholdership that stopped that? I mean, you'd say the same thing about Swift, right? Why are we talking about any of this? Mm. Right. Why has Swift not driven all this digitization? Swift has been there since 1970s, guys. We're talking about a 50 year old digital company that actually what it did in the 1970s to banking is phenomenal at an innovation level. Absolutely unbelievable achievement. Yet after that, you know, it, well, the MT700 series is not is not has not achieved the same levels of adoption as as the other message series they've had in, in payments, for example. But, but throughout their business, their focus is quite is in quite narrow areas. They're very big in, in cross-border payments, but not necessarily in um, you know domestic securities, for example. So it's a it's a it's a, it's a success, but a but a partial one. Um, Magnus, you've been you've been very quiet. I wonder if you give us a flavor of clearly it would help if there were standards. You know, if you just if you were just selling a trade finance engine like you could sell a Swift engine to a bank, it would be a lot easier for your your business. But are there are there um, uh, developments you see happening, say, in blockchain um, or other Internet of Things or, or other forms of technology which which could accelerate this this process of digitizing trade finance? Mm. Yes, I definitely, most definitely. I think the, the technical innovation is certainly helping the innovation in the business on the business level as well. And I think you mentioned too that, that there are great examples of that. So, but blockchain, for example, really lends itself to to the kind of processes that we're talking about here. In 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 that data is is local and distributed at the same time. So so you know you have a true copy and it's it's in your note and then someone else has has the same thing um and the the way you, you work with smart contracts and so on they that it's of course standards help and, and you need to kind of agree but, but the, the frameworks around it can be a bit looser if you like and the the, communi the communication between people can be based uh, sort of on, on data elements ra rather than on a very rigid structure that you have in, tra in traditional trading APIs and so on. Um, so so, so we, we need both, if you like. But do we, we, we do have blockchain startups operating in trade finance like Marco Polo and Trade IX at Contour and so on. I mean, do we have any sense of how successful these are, these are proving? Are they getting traction? Does anyone know? Without... 
I, I don't, we haven't used any of them, but the, it comes back to some of the points made earlier that blockchain, I, I do feel is a great part of the solution here, but until all of the physical reality can connect with the digital part of the blockchain, it's, some, it's somewhat flawed, right? Until you have, you take our trade cycle, if every warehouse along the way and every shipping line, et cetera, needs to be connected, otherwise there's gaps. And so that's why in my mind, it has to be adopted by businesses and trading companies who are, who are doing this, because if it's just coming from the outside, then there's always going to be missing gaps. So I suppose that's where we're trying to take our business in the next few years, actually take the full end to end side and connect all of the physicality with the with the digital world, because otherwise it doesn't work. So I think it's, and that's what I sort of see, you know, 20 years ago when I first started in this world um there weren't very many pieces of the puzzle there you know now if we look at everyone on their on this call we've got pieces of the puzzle what we need to do is sort of bring them all together because i think there's very little that's lacking other than uh you know this will of right and this has happened a number of times in the last 15 months right actually let's just all do it now you know there's all of the pieces let's pull it together and do it. And those who don't get on board get left behind. So I think all of these things are incredibly valuable, but not in isolation. They're all little islands which we need to bring together, is, is my view. No, I totally agree with Jeffrey. And in fact, he mentioned islands, and, and that's part of the problem is that certainly in the traditional financial financial industry, we're seeing digital islands being sort of developed where if you, you, your suppliers, your buyers, everyone is all working in the same bank, great, you can all digitize with each other. But if you've got a supplier who's not with the same bank, it's not going to work. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's a kind of a legacy mindset, unfortunately, that we have to build it and we have to own it completely. And, and uh, we don't we don't collaborate with anybody. I mean, for what we're doing um, as a non-trader, but certainly the mecha mechanisms of what we're doing looks like a trader because we're a neutral principle between suppliers and buyers. We've got to handle all of this data from the suppliers and to the end buyers. And we, we do a lot of stuff into Africa and out of Africa. Um, and certainly going back to Jeffrey's comment as well, uh, we find them extremely receptive. And often, as they've done in other industries like telecoms, they've been able to jump away. Don't bother with copper cables, just go straight to microwave. So, you know, we find that now... Uh, you mentioned IoT devices. We use IoT devices uh, produced um, out of uh, Europe and uh, Asia. Um, we deploy them into places like Tanzania, Rwanda, Kenya. Uh, we're able to keep track of our containers. We know if, if the, the, the truck driver stops for too long or goes down the wrong road, um, and if the ship is on time, um, and whether it's too humid, too hot, someone's opened up the, the door <laughs> and is stealing it. Um, you know, again, it's all about sort of prevention and just making it harder for, for things to go wrong, or at least to, to know things have gone wrong faster. Um, but my point being that we're able to do that now because the cost of technology is coming down. You know, we can tag every single bag of rice that we own for a couple of cents. You know, we can uh, put on a custom seal with, uh, with real-time tracking, humidity, temperature, everything else, a couple hundred dollars. That's if we buy it. You know, there are other interesting fintech business models out there where we don't have to buy the devices. They'll just rent it to us for the journey and they'll pick it up at the other end. So I think, you know, we're, um, you know, I appreciate Jeffrey's frustration because we're living this every day as well. But the good news is, I think, is that the, the cost and the access of that technology um, is now getting to the point where it is feasible um, for us to do it cost effectively without uh, uh, causing a, a cop prices right. in the supermarket but to go up. This prompts, a, prompts a rogue thought by me, which is that um, one reason that Africa was able to pioneer, for example, mobile phone payments is because there was no infrastructure to compete with. The banks just were not there. So Impesa was able to step in and do what it did. Is the same likely to be true of, say, SME emerging market financing, where their need is very great, there is no legacy to displace, and it sounds from what you're saying, in particular, Tom, that, that you can get the data you need to prove that these people who are, they say they are, and they're not going to steal the bags of rice and, and so on. Is it possible that actually the SME fund, that three trillion funding gap, could be just the 
incentive that actually proves there is a whole different way of doing trade finance. And so they kind of pioneer how to do things and the developed world, as it were, catches up afterwards. Yeah, I, I think I speak for everyone on the panel here that we're, you know, we're working, we're working on that problem. Uh, there, there, uh, the one thing I would say is that, I mean, I agree with totally with, with Jeffrey that there's a massive problem there. And, and I think everyone on the panel here is trying in their own way to work for solutions on different key mm -hmm. areas there. It's starting to come together. Um, um, but I think we, I'm certainly very cautious of using the word disintermediation because then immediately you put people on the defense. We collaborate with banks because we don't lend money we're no threat to banks whatsoever, and we work with them. And a lot of the banks give us their customers, you know, because they can't help them saying these are great guys. They've got a lot of, uh, they personally have a lot of history and good careers, but they've just set up a new company. In three years, we'll be able to help them, but not now, you know. So I think the key thing there is that people, you know, just avoid the word disintermediation, you know, blah, blah, and just collaborate. It's a massive problem. <laughs> it's the thing uh, so. about disintermediation as a word is it's scary. And you're right, collaboration is key. And I think at the heart of all of this, it is really this cultural shift from everyone going, how can I make loads of money to actually how can, if we all work together, how can we all make a decent right. amount of money? You know, it's not that, it's, it's, it's less driven by greed, but actually let's help everyone else to work. And that's a, a cultural shift, which I think is happening anyway. I agree. I think the collaboration is really picking up, but it takes a bit of maturity, right? Because most people who start a company, and I'll say this as a founder, right? You think you're going to conquer the world and you're going to do everything and you're going to be the next Amazon, right? And it takes a bit of time of reality to pick in and go, well, actually, you know what? Maybe we're going to do this piece. And in, in a world where there's a lot of startups, there, there, there requires a level of maturation uh, of people's ideologies and their business model before they recognize that. But when we talk about digital silos, we're seeing those break down a lot. We're doing massive amounts of integration with other partners and other platforms. And I'll give you the super cool project that we're doing, which should go live next month. We have an exporter whose data is coming out of their ERP system, comes into our platform. It's then shared with multiple people on the export side who then get involved in drafting and surveying and, and signing documentation. Then it's transferred as original data to banks into another platform where the importer and the importing bank sits. It then goes to them to get custom cleared. And then the data goes all the way into Chinese customs. So you've got data really going from the source of an ERP system ultimately to the ultimate consumer in many ways, which is the importing custom system. And, and that's through you know, about five or six different platforms. That's the sort of interoperability problems that people are talking about. But again, that also requires a level of maturation, right? You can't have a, a system that you're evolving um, with mature APIs because those two things don't, don't, don't work. So you need relatively mature companies, both in their business model and their technology, and then interoperability will come. And, and I, I think people recognize it. And actually, we just finished a, a transaction with Contour, talking about Contour. So we do a lot with them. Um, so I, I think this sort of digital silo issue is being resolved um but look we're into uh, you know we have to stop in a couple of minutes but uh, i'd like to and this conversation could obviously go on for many hours but it can't um i just wonder if, if we could come up with something which everybody listening could could take away with them as as, as something they could do or, or or push forward when they uh, i was about to say go back to the office they're not be in the office but the metaphorical office um is there is there one if you had a fairy godmother is there what would you ask that fairy godmother to do for you to make trade finance um, achieve the goals we've been talking about today of increasing capacity, increasing processing efficiency or, or digitization? What would that, that one thing be? Um, what would accelerate progress, do you think? Magnus, why don't you tell us what your answer would be by your by expert systems, obviously, but... Uh, <laughs> obviously, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, th I think it is to a couple of different answers there, and then one is one is I mean procurement and vendor selection is important, and, and it is to be a bit bold and think outside the box and and actually trust new modern technology. I mean it, Tom phrased it really well with with IOTs, for example, that they are so incredibly inexpensive now that the, 
and, and that is happening across the board, right? So, so the kind of technology that we, we represent uh, here, the, the, it's the, the cost element has just in the last few years dramatically gone down. And that just opens up to new possibilities and new ideas. So, you know, be, be curious and, and ask vendors and, and collaborate, I think is yeah. a key. Thing. Okay, so Gert, uh, you heard Magnus say, trust the technology, it's cheap and it works. Um, you've been at digitization for a long time now. What, what, what's, the, what's the magic source that makes it happen? Uh, good question. So um, I think in, in what we're doing, you know, we, we, we're both offering early early payments for large corporates, small and medium sized customers. We're doing marketplaces, we're doing accounts payable automation. So when we are in any of those conversations, whether it's with AP or procurement or treasury or finance, I think if people would think about those who they are trying to digitize, so so the, the suppliers or vendors or, or merchants, what's in it for them? Like, um, how, how do you design your digitization journey as with an ecosystem mindset and ask what can you actually bring back to those you want to have participating in your digitization and i think far too often it's the compliance mindset or the efficiency mindset um, or the risk mindset that that drives this journey uh, I, I i think if everybody asked that question what's what's yeah. what's it in for my partner so, Tom, you, you've already talked about incentivizing people, and uh, Gert has been very eloquent. You know, don't wait for compliance to tell you what to do. Don't talk only about efficiency. Um, talk about what it's in it for you. And, and Magnus has mentioned trust the technology; it's cheap. You know, all of that will be resonating with you. Do you do you have an insight of your own you'd want to add that the audience can take away with them? Yeah, I'm all pretty pretty comfy about the technology and stuff. I think it's 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 here and now, and uh, it's it's very timely uh, to be put to good use. Um, one thing I would say actually is just uh, you know, if I had a fairy godmother, would be to ask governments to appreciate and supranationals and development agencies to appreciate that banks are no longer on their own the solution to the trade finance gap and trade finance issues that we face and to enable some of the, uh, you know, the uh, sort of import-export guarantees and other systems that are in place there uh, to the non-financial institutions, um, because it's, uh, it is a collaborative answer, I think, uh, to the trade finance gap. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, um, the slightly thankless task with three people already having given, given verdicts, but what would you ask the fairy godmother to do to trade finance? I think quite simply, just get everyone today to accept that the future is one of digitization when it comes to this and where there are challenges on how it can benefit, put all of those aside and realize that they'll, they'll follow. So I think it's one of mindset of just uh, acknowledging, as with many other things in our world, this is the future. We don't know all of the solutions, but uh, let's accept that today and work together and find a solution. Thanks. So now, last word from you, Alex. You've been trying to drive paper out of this industry for 15 years. Um, what's the thing that you think would have really helped that process, which you still don't have? So I'm going to echo a bit of Magnus and a bit of Jeffrey, which is if you're a company, you're an exporter, an importer, a trader, just try some of these things. You're going to need to do pilots, see what works for you, what doesn't. If you're a bank, Banks are never going to go back into SME financing. The, the value that it's not affordable for them. You need to do the sort of thing that HSBC has done with trade shift. You need to invest. You need to use these alternative finance platforms and funnel money into it. Um, and I think if you get that sort of combination, the corporates trying new things and the banks financing through alternative platforms will start to narrow this gap very quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, thank you. To all of you, uh, that's where we must uh, draw stumps, I'm afraid. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, by name. I'd like to thank Alex Galandris of S-Docs and Gert Silvestre from TradeShift, uh, Magnus uh, from Expri, Tom James from TradeFlow, and Jeffrey de Mowbray from Dints International. I'd like to thank the audience too for, for, for listening and for your question. Uh, our next event at Future of Finance is Tuesday, 29th of June at our usual time of 1400 London time. 
In it, we're meeting the authors of what's been called the best book on payments ever written. A low bar, the cynics might think, but do think again. Our authors are the former SWIFT Chief Executive Officer, Gottfried Liebrandt, and the former Head of Corporate Affairs at SWIFT, Natasha de Turan. And their book, I know this because I've read it, is a fascinating tour of what is and more often isn't uh, happening in the rapidly changing world of payments. I hope that uh, lots of you can join us then and ask our authors lots of probing questions. Please do.